page number 167. Sing with me. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Thy throne is established. 
Thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice, and floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mighty than the noise of the waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. I want to bring your attention to verse number two. Thy throne is established of old. <clears throat> Thou art from everlasting. Father, I pray you bless the reading of your We use it for your honor and glory. Encourage hearts today. Encourage us in the work that you do in our lives, in our hearts. No matter how difficult sometimes that work may be, I pray, Lord, you would do your work. I pray these things in thy name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. My grandfather, you know, most of you know, my grandfather was a pastor. And um, I spent a lot of time with him growing up. When my, when my, uh, when my grandparents, when my, when my mother went to work, uh, when I was about four years old, from the time I was four to six, uh, um, uh, till I started school, I was both working. I went to spend that time with my grandparents. They didn't have daycare back then, and uh, uh, we. I spent those years uh, every day. I spent time every day with my grandparents. I loved it. Uh, my mom actually apologized to me for, you know, having to go to war. I said, don't you dare apologize to me for sending me to Mamaw and Papaw's house and for crying out loud. I said, that's some of the most joyful memories that I have of my childhood is being with my grandfather. And I mean, I was his buddy. I was close to him. And I uh, spent all those times with him in his shop while he was refinishing furniture. And uh, during the summer, my sister and I both went over there and stayed. And um, uh, while we were out of school, once we were in school, we were over there before, uh, over there after time. But um, I got to know my grandfather probably better than any of his grandchildren. And what a blessing it was. Funerals that he preached during that time. I got to know, I got very familiar with Dudley and Hughes funeral home in Dallas, Texas. They're still a beautiful colonial building. And I remember going in there and I'm walking around and I'm looking at this place. And my grandfather, he's there, and he's all in his black suit and looking all sharp and had his had his Schofield King James Bible. And he's consoling people and he had such a wonderful way with just speaking to people and calming them and bringing them to peace. He had, he had a marvelous way with how he spoke to people. I, I, I learned that. I tried to emulate that. And um, they're next to him looking around thinking, man, this is one of the most gorgeous places I've ever seen. Beautiful furniture. It was so elegant. I'd never seen a place so elegant. Granted, there's a dead guy over the corner, but I mean, other than that, it was a really nice place. So, but I remember my grandfather speaking to these people and he's comforting them. And, and I remember so many times him using this phrase, he would speak to them. And he would <coughs> say this, God still sits on the throne. And I didn't think much about it when I was a boy. He sold those people. And I'd be out with him as he was doing his other work and everything, running errands, picking up paint, whatever he was doing, going to the hardware store, and they'd talk to him. Reverend Harris, how you doing? All fine. Doing good. Hey, what's a good word? They'd say that to him. They'd say that to preacher. What's a good word? And he sits on the throne. I had no idea at the time the foundation that my grandfather for that little four, five, six-year-old boy that he was dragging in tow. 
I had no idea words would come to me to me. God still sits on the throne. The Bible says here in Psalm 93, thy throne is established of old. Thou art from ever lasting. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 12, saying, Amen. Blessing and honor and wisdom and thanks, uh, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto <coughs> God forever and ever. The Bible says in Psalm 93, 1, the Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. God still sits. If I could give you one great truth today, a great preacher that I learned a lot from growing up. And uh, learn a lot about preaching, learn a lot about pastoring from him. <clears throat> and he said, if you can take, take to your people one great truth in that message, in your message, you try truth that will stick with them when they leave your service. And if I could do that today, I would give you this one great message God still sits on the throne. I don't care who's in Washington. God still sits on the throne. Doesn't matter who's in the White House. God sits on the throne. It doesn't matter what's happening in Hollywood or New York or Dallas or uh, Bettendorf, Iowa. It doesn't matter. God still sits on the throne. It doesn't matter. We might be having the most wonderful, joyous day of our life. And we say with joy, God is on his throne. But I want you to know when everything is going wrong, when everything is falling apart, when everything is hurting, when everything is dark and it's a valley that you don't see the end of, I want you to know that God still sits on the throne. God is sovereign. God is king. And God will not abdicate that throne no matter what our circumstance, no matter what our trial, God still sits on the throne. We know that God, number one, we know that this speaks to, what does this tell us? Tell us about God, that he is king. It speaks of his sovereignty. It speaks of his sovereignty. Great document that led to the great nation that we are today. You think, oh, well, that's the Constitution. No, there was one before that. There was, a, there was a document before that that laid the groundwork for the Constitution that gives us the liberties and gives us the limited government that we're supposed to have. And that document is called the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was a document that was drafted and became law, uh, established their parliament, and what happened was it made the laws such <clears throat> that the king was no longer the absolute law. It meant that the king was subject to the law, was greater than the king. Before that time, the king was sovereign. The king was absolute law. What the king got? Whatever the king, if the king murdered somebody, that was okay because he was the king. If the king uh, took a man's wife and her as his own, that was okay. He was king. He could get away with that. There was no law. There was no arresting the king. There was assassinating the king. There was overthrowing the king. Kids, I need y'all to be still on the back, please. Thank you. There was, uh, there was subjugating the king. There was running him out of town, killing everybody that was uh, in his family and everything, so they couldn't take control. And a lot of that went on. <laughs> but the king was law. Now, that, that's, that's not necessarily a good thing. The nation of, uh, of Israel, we see particularly after the division of the nation of Israel, uh, they were a divided kingdom after Solomon. His son, Rehoboam, was a mediocre king at best. Uh, and uh, there was a split of the kingdom. 
and the tribes, the ten northern tribes, followed a man named Jeroboam. No, that was not Rehoboam's brother. Okay, when Jeroboam and Rehoboam and all the Boam brothers. No, it was they were they were not related, and they will have no. We will have no part with King David. They they split this way. They split that way, uh, and yet the the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, which was Judah and Benjamin, became. Judah, and the rest of the tribes were Israel. And they had king after king after king after king. And, and Judah had king after king. Judah had kings. And they had some wicked kings too. Some of the worst. First, Israel. I mean, they had, they had some kings that uh, were not as bad as the next guy. But they never really had any good king when he destroyed Jezebel and Ahab. But, uh, you know, still, he, he really wasn't godly in any res respect. That was political. So you're at the mercy of a human king. You're at the mercy of a mortal king as to his, whatever his whims were with the law. But I want you to know that we serve a righteous king. We serve a godly king. We serve a merciful king. He is sovereign. He is in control. Isn't that wonderful that he's in? There are so many things that go on that are out of I can't control, really. I can vote, but I can't control what Washington does. I can't control if the world goes wicked. Somebody lets me down. I can't control uh, whether or not a church member does right or does wrong. I'll tell you something. It is a miserable pastor, and it is a pastor that will get out of line real quick if he spends his life trying to control the lives of his people. I'm not here to control your life. That's not a call. I, I have to abide by the same law you do. I'm the message boy telling you, if you don't do this right, it's going to mess you up. And I can help you proceed. But there are so many things that are out of our control. I can't control what anybody does. I can't control, quite frankly, what my wife does. She's a free moral agent. I can influence, I can lead, I can guide, I can protect her and provide for her. I can do all of those things, but she has her own opinion. I can't control my children. He said, yeah, I know you can't control your children. <laughs> oh, but, uh, I, I, can, I can force them for a time to behave. But beyond that, once they're out, once they're on their own, I can't make my son one time. Right after he left home, my oldest son called me and he said, uh, "He said I want to, I, I want to ask you about something. I've got this opportunity and I've got that opportunity. And explain it. Which one should I take?" I said, "That's entirely up to you." But based on what you're telling me, I, that one. Well, that's not the one I want. I said, then take the other one. He said, that's it? I said, what did you expect? He said, well, I expected you to tell me what to do. I said, no, you walked out from under my authority. You're on your own. I'm not authority anymore. You don't answer to me anymore. You answer directly to God now. Well, that sounded different. Uh, he's not under my authority. In January 6th of 1980, I walked out of my parents' house, never again to be. My dad said, I, my, I walked out of the house and was getting ready for our marriage, getting ready for our wedding on uh, January the 5th of 1981, uh, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I walked out of the house. So I got into the, I had the pickup truck in. And uh, so I got into my 1971 Toyota Corolla and I turned around and I looked at the house. Dad said, take a good look at it. It won't be home anymore. He said, it'll always be home because you're always welcome. Now he wasn't, but you understand this was a very joyous occasion. But when I was getting married. It was wonderful. It was a happy day. And I was leaving on the right terms. But when I got in that driveway and drove off, I was driving away. I was walking away from the 
the authority of my dad. He could not, he could, you know, he, he still had an influence. He was still a counselor. And I was always close to my dad. I always had a great relationship with him all of my life. But I wasn't under his authority. I would have been an idiot not to take his advice to get his counsel, at least find out what he thought. I did often, but he couldn't tell me what to do. Why? Because then I'm not under, your children aren't under your control anymore. I want you to know that God is always in control. I want you to know that, hey, and listen, you say that there's something to go differently and I'd, I'd, make, I'd, I'd make it happen differently. Thank God you're not in control. I thank God. Isn't it liberating to know that you don't have to control those things? Isn't that liberating to know that you don't have to, you're not for what anybody else does but yourself? Isn't it, isn't it, I'll tell you what, it, it'd be bad if I was in control. It'd be a bad thing if I was in control because I'd mess it up. Man, if I was in control, uh, it, it, it wouldn't be good. Because I'm not rightly, and I'm not sovereign, and I'm not perfect, and I'm not, uh, I'm not the essence of what is holy. I'm not God. God is sovereign. We, we, we free, we, uh, those of us who believe in free moral agency, those of us who believe in the free will of man, don't hold to the hyper-Calvinist position that God chooses who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. I saw that little thing. Uh, Jesus, I saw this little thing on the internet. Jesus, Jesus chose me. This I know. Or John Piper tells me so. The ones who uh, I forget the words. Are the ones who are. Uh, anyways, I blew it anyway. But uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I. I God didn't put a gun to my head and tell me I had to get saved anymore. And he put a gun to somebody else's head and tell them they had to go to hell. There's no hope for them. There's no hope for them. They're not going to be saved. They can't be saved because God didn't choose them. That's the most damnable doctrine out of hell you ever heard right there. Uh, that five-point Calvinistic doctrine is, is, oh, don't you believe in eternal security? Yeah, but I don't have a problem with eternal security and by the way what Calvinists believe about eternal security is wrong because they believe it's based on God choosing who gets saved and who doesn't so if you if, if you're chosen it doesn't matter if you want to get saved or not you're saved whether you like it or not if you're chosen and if you want to be saved and you're, well you, you might as well just go on to hell because that's where you're going to end up well, that's, a, that's an encouraging doctrine. <laughs> it's also not biblical. But I'm not afraid of that term sovereign. It's interesting. When you think of control, God still sits on the throne. It speaks of his sovereignty. It speaks of his majesty. Psalm 104 verse 1 says, Blessed Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, great. Thou art clothed in honor and majesty. Psalm 145, verse 5. Glorious honor of thy majesty and of the one of and of thy wondrous work. You know why you ought to be reading Psalms every day? That reminds you of who God is. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 10 says enter into the rock hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty verse 19 of that same chapter says and they shall hold the rocks and the caves and the earth for fear of the Lord for his glory and his majesty this arrogant prideful wicked world is one day going to see the face of of Jesus Christ the King. And they're not going to be so arrogant. That it's not a Facebook post. They're not going to be so prideful. And dismissive. Of the, of the Jesus Christ. Once they see him. They'll hide in the rocks. 
is go, go into the cleft of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises and shake terribly the earth. I think about the comparison in that verse over in Psalms. The heathen raged and the earth trembled. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. You see the comparison? David said, I have seen the wicked in his day spreading himself like a green bay tree. I have sought him, but he cannot be found. Anybody seen anything recently written by Adolf Hitler or any of his followers? Well, what happened to him? I mean, he was so powerful. He took a nation the size of the state of Arkansas and conquered Europe. And him and a guy named Himmler decided it was time to start killing Jews. And you messed up, pal. And within a matter of years, he was, he was in a hole in the ground, literally in a hole in the ground, blowing his own head off. You don't mess with God's people. You don't cross the king. Oh, you might have been the dictator, but you are not the king. And they will hide themselves in the rocks and the cliffs, and they will cry, and they will cry out that the stones and the mountains will fall on them to hide them from the face of him that is to come. He is sovereign. It speaks of his sovereignty. It speaks of his majesty. It speaks of his power. I studied out God's power. And in the New Testament, when the Bible speaks of God's power, you know what the, the, the actual subject of the context of almost every single verse I found was? Salvation. Romans, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 says, but unto to them which are called both Jews and Greeks, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 2 Corinthians 6, 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness of the right hand and on the left. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4 says, He was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we, uh, for we also are weak in him. And we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. 2 Timothy 1, Not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of his prisoner. <clears throat> But be thou a partaker of the affliction according to the power of God. It's amazing how many times the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, by the power of God through faith and the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Man, I'm glad to know that I am not kept in Christ by the power of my ability. I'm not kept in the I'm not kept for salvation according to my my sin, according to my capabilities, according to my talent, according to my purity, according to my holiness, according to my righteousness. I'm not. I'm kept by the power of God. I'm kept by the power of God in his hand and I can't lose it. I can't lose my salvation. I didn't do anything to get it in the first place. The Bible says we're kept by the power of God. We're sealed. And he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he 
is the one with the it speaks of his power it speaks of his authority jesus said in matthew chapter 28 verse 18 it says and jesus came and spake unto them all power is given to me in heaven and earth that word power there is referring to authority the power in acts chapter 1 8 ye shall receive power after the holy ghost has come upon you that's strength that's dunamis that's uh, that's from the uh, that word power comes from the same word we get the word dynamite. Dunamis. That's Acts 1 8. Here he's speaking about his authority. When God speaks, he speaks with authority. When I open up the word of God, I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm not giving you my plan. I'm not giving you uh, my wisdom. Paul said, We do not speak with our own wisdom. You know, I can be wise to the wisdom of man. No. The wisdom of God. This is the authority right here. You check our Constitution. It says it. we believe the Bible is the perfect, preserved, inspired word of God, preserved for us in the life, and is our final authority for faith and practice. I am not the final authority. I am the message boy. This is the authority. And it's not of any private interpretation. That means that uh, it doesn't mean one thing for you and one thing means the same thing for me. It means the same thing for you. Thou shalt not. It's a two-edged sword. You know what? The, the sharper than any two. That means it cuts both ways. Amen. God still sits on authority and speaks of his majesty. It speaks of his power. <clears throat> but what does all that mean to the Christian? Okay, great. He's powerful. He's authority. He's, he's sovereign. He's majestic. He's powerful. He's king. Well, that's a nice, pleasant thought. Y'all have a nice day. No, I want to know what it means to me Monday morning. Number one, it means my relationship. Number one, my relationship. I have a relationship with the king. I was reminding a young lady about living godly, and I said, you're a daughter of the king. I was reminding a young man about keeping his life. You're a child of the king. You're a son of the king. A lady said to me one time, she was trying to sell me something. Go ahead and buy it. You deserve it. You're a king's kid. I said, I appreciate that. The Bible also says I'm under tutor, I'm under tutors and governors until the time appointed. <laughs> you be careful. You be careful about how you sling that time of the king thing around when it comes to your own selfishness. It means that I have a relationship. It means that I have authority. You know the story of the prodigal son? When he came back to the father, by the way, that's not a picture of a lost man coming to Christ. Primarily, primarily the number one, the first and primary interpretation of that is Israel coming back to God. Secondarily, it is a picture of a Christian getting away from Christ and coming back. Out of his backslid mire, and that's how we apply it. You know, a, 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 a scripture only has one or two interpretations. It has many applications. It only has one interpretation, but it has many applications. And the primary application is Israel and God. The secondary application is us with Christ to come back. And he came back naked and broken and, and dirty. And the father did three things. The father gave him three things. He put a ring on his finger. In that culture, that represented authority. He had the authority because he was a son. He wasn't going to be a servant. He wasn't going to be a slave. He was a son. He had relationship. The other thing is he put a clothes on his back. 
That is a type of the righteousness of us and the position that we have. The uh, third thing is he put new shoes on his feet. I love new shoes. I, I love new shoes. I have to think about wearing them. I like wearing a pair of new shoes. There's just something about it. All of a sudden, your feet don't hurt, you know, because you're out running bare and your feet have been cold or they've been hot and they've been beat up because you've been walking in pig slop and you've been walking out there. He put shoes on. That's a picture of God providing for us. That's a picture of just our daily provisions. God, he provided for us. And he set a table before him. See, God still sits on the throne. And that affects my him. I have authority as a child. I have access to the Father. With Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. I have access, the Bible says in Romans. I have access to the Father through Christ. But another thing is I also have a responsibility. There's a Latin term that was that I signed. Um, a Latin phrase that says noblesse oblige. Noblesse oblige. It means the obligation of the noble. You know what that means? That means you have a position in Christ. You have a position as a child of the king that position you have certain responsibilities that you need to fulfill you have an obligation because of your position we are a royal priesthood a royal priesthood a noble family a peculiar people sanctified unto good works you have a responsibility because your father's the king. You don't get to live like everybody else. Number one, it means my means my security. I'm secure in Christ. Not because he's good. He is. Not because he's righteous, either, but he is. But because he's king. Do you know in the Bible why, you remember why Saul, because in the Bible, you could be a prophet, a priest, or a king. Prophets, priests, and kings. A priest could be a prophet. A king. But a, and, but a, a king could not Fulfill the office of a priest. The king could not be the intercessor. Saul got in trouble because Samuel didn't show up. Samuel was supposed to make an offering to the Lord. He didn't show up on time, and uh, according to Saul. And Saul went ahead and performed the priestly duties. As king, he performed the priestly duties that Samuel would perform. And when Samuel came and saw what he had Done. He turned his back on him, and 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 and, and uh, uh, Saul went to pull him back, and he tore Samuel's garment, trying to keep him from walking away from him. And Samuel turned and said, "As thou hast torn this from me, God hath torn the nation of Israel from you." You couldn't be white because there's only one who could be prophet. Priest and king. Only one. Jesus Christ, the righteous. The man, Christ Jesus. What did Pilate say? Some very, very ominous words when he marched Jesus out there wearing that crown of thorns. Behold your king. They will hear those words again one day. My relationship, my security, my destiny, his kingdom. That means today I'm working for his kingdom. Today I'm seeking his kingdom. Today
today. Uh, Jesus said, yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust doth, doth uh, corrupt and thieves do break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He said, uh, ask not what you shall eat or drink or what you shall do. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Why? Because that's my destiny. So what does it say to the lost? What does it say to the lost that he's king? It means that the king of glory, the God of the universe, down to earth to lift you up out of sin and judgment. The universe laid aside his throne and crown To die for you. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says. Let this mind be in you. There's also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form. Of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He submitted himself to the second most powerful force in the universe, death. And it says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Today, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, if you're trusting in your works, if you're trusting in your religion, that is not what is demanded of the king. The king demands a sacrifice. And then he turned around and became a sacrifice. One day you will bow before that king. Before being ushered into the throne room of God. Or before being cast into hell. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I'd rather take care of that. If I was you, I'd take care of that business right now. Don't wait till then. Settle the question of your own salvation here at an altar. Settle the question, if you die today, do you know you go to heaven or do you have some doubts? Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The king of all the universe is still on the throne. He will judge in righteousness and he will rule in justice with mercy. And in mercy he extends to you. What the Bible refers to as his righteous scepter. And he offers to you today a gift, a gift of eternal life. You see, you face the judgment of God on your sins. If you die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? Or do you have some doubts? No question today. It's very simple. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe. In the name of the Son of God, that you may know, not hope so, not think so, know so. All you have to understand is that you're a sinner, and that Christ died on the cross for those sins and rose again on the third day, and you can place your faith and trust in Him and come to Him as a sinner and pray, trust you, wash your sins away, and give you heaven for a home, and He'll be your King. Say, preacher, God spoke to my heart today through the message. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. Say, preacher, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Put your hands down. We're going to have a couple of verses of invitation. If God's dealing with your heart today, maybe you're not settled the question of your salvation, your eternity. Settle the question. Father, that's our message. I pray you bless this invitation.
going to use it, Your Honor's word. There's one here today that doesn't. I pray the Holy Spirit would convict them that they would be drawn and that we would see them come and place their faith and trust in you. And I pray these things. Tonight, and as the music plays, the altar's open. Whatever the Lord's you, they are not dead. 